Let us pray. Gracious Lord, thank you on this holy night. We can gather here in your presence, in the presence of your Son, the very one who was born and laid in a manger. Open up, O oh God, our hearts and minds to his presence. Form in us that which you desire. Change us, O oh God and open our hearts to your love and great joy. Speak to us, Lord, for your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I don't know how the last three or four weeks have been for you, but I must confess to you that for me, they've been a marathon. Everything from what it is that you have to buy to dealing with people, at least in my line of work, for whom this is an extraordinarily difficult time. People in genuine need to navigating stuff that's going on in the life of the family, which even in the best of families is a mixed bag. Isn't that right? Nod your head. None of this, none of this is sort of easy. It's just how it is. And then especially if you're in the sort of inside baseball world called the Episcopal Church, we usually have a little bit of time between the fourth Sunday of Advent, which was this morning, and then Christmas Eve tonight, which makes all of it feel just a little bit more truncated than normal. And then I also want to confess to you that we deal with things uh, even in a more escalated way in terms of difficulty because we do seem to be a nation on edge. We know things are not right. There's this kind of tribal factionalism that is only getting worse and not better. And so while there's some people excited, other people are in difficulty, there's still a sense that mm, things are not as they should be, which I think plays in to a lot of the difficulty that people feel just in their day-to-day -day lives. I mean, I don't know about you, but I get up early in the morning just to be quiet because as soon as the television goes on, bang, it's everything from the latest pronouncement to a murder down you know where, and here we are. It's Tuesday, and we're going to get going again. So my, my uh, longing is to actually just go sit up there by the crash and take it in. You see, there is a certain level of familiarity that we have with Christmas that can in fact block us from having our hearts enlarged by what it is that is being declared and what is actually really going on. In fact, there's actually a scientific study that was recently published that said, the more that you think you know about something, in fact, the less you know. Because your own self-assurance in the knowledge that you have actually crowds out your capacity to be able to learn new things. And so when I go, I've been wrestling with that and trying to think about, okay, in this maybe my more than 100th sermon around Christmas, what are you trying to say to me first? And I must tell you, the first thing that I just continue to see, but in a brand new way, is the sort of outlying location and all that that means for this momentous birth. What a beautiful artist, if you don't know him, he's a painter, look him up, by the name of Charlie Mackesy in England, recently described as the most vulnerable event in the history of the cosmos. Why would it happen in the middle of nowhere, on the backside of an occupied country, with actually some rather, some characters of ill repute, shepherds? And the more I look at it, the more I begin to see what God is trying to put together, although I must confess to you that this miracle of the incarnation is far bigger than any of us can even begin to grasp. If you think you understand it, it just shows you're wrong. You can get at it, 
but it's very tough to get in it, especially if you want to remain the same in that journey. And I think about Joseph. Luke tells us that the reason they went back to Bethlehem was because Joseph was born of the house and lineage of David. So why didn't he go home? Why did he end up, in the essence, in the outlying sort of cave resident stable of an innkeeper when he had family? And what does that tell you about Joseph? Is, was there a breach with him, or is he just trying to protect the scandal of the fact that he is betrothed to a woman, not yet his wife, who is nine months pregnant, and trying to protect her from the scandal and the gossip that would go with this carpenter, one we respect, marrying her, more than likely a 14-year-old girl pregnant? Or, or was that something else happening here that we don't quite understand? Even the shepherds notice. Kenneth Bailey, who's a tremendous New Testament scholar, says that the reason the angels were so specific in saying, this is the sign for you, meaning you shepherds, for you will find this baby wrapped in strips of cloth and laid in a manger. Because you see, what they would say when they hear that is, oh, that's just like our kids. See, they were poverty-stricken. They were ne'er-do-wells. They were even, by the law, unclean because of what they did. Very much on the margin of society. And so when the angel announces to them that this baby <laughs> isn't wrapped in stuff from kids' pottery barn, but that instead is just wrapped up in bands of cloth and lay in a hay filled with, that's a feeding trough, they would go like our kids. That would tell them that they were welcome, that they could in fact make the trek and know that what would not happen is that when they came to the door, Joseph or someone else would go, unclean, there's a baby here, unclean. No, the very sign of the baby wrapped in these cloths was the sign that they two were welcome. You see, Martin Luther put it this way, if the baby was born and laid in a cradle of gold, it would be a splendid affair. But I would not be comforted. And if these are tidings of comfort and joy, which shall be for all people, that means no matter who you are, there's room for you here. There is room at the stable. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. But to get there and to stay there changes you. Because it's not just a question of you being let in. It's, you, it's the terms on which you have been let in. The terms that says, this is who God is manifesting himself. God, the God of the universe, the babe born, the cha life-changing moment in the whole cosmos, chooses to manifest himself among a bunch of unclean ne'er-do-wells in the worst part of town. What does that say to you about how we view humanity? how we reference and deal with our, pref our social preferences and the people that we like and we don't like. There's a kind of radicalness to this that says, what does it look like to be the people who belong to this man? It means we're all leveled. Education, family background, social etiquette, all of the things by which we judge others, intellectual capacity, the ability to lead well and get things done, all of those take a back seat when we come to the Savior. When we come to the Savior that says that there's room for everyone, which means if I am going to be one of His, I need God to, I need God to literally come and break my heart so that there is room in me 
for even the people I don't like, don't want to hang around with, people for, for whom I would prefer really weren't around. He plays at this, Jesus does, literally all of his life. Let me read you a little poem by actually a relatively famous American poet by X, called X.J. Kennedy, and it's called A Scandal in the Suburbs. You know, we had to have him put away. For what if he had grown vicious to play faith healer, give away bread and fishes? His soapbox preaching set the tongues of all the neighborhood going. Odd stuff, how li lilies never spin, birds don't bother sewing. Why, even the homeless were coming to the doors. His pocket had no bottom. And then, the foot washing from that whore, we signed, they came and got him. All of the protection you see that we do to somehow create for ourselves a place of safety against them, whomever they might be, runs in fact directly counter to the life of Jesus who was scandalizing everybody for hanging out with publicans and sinners. And if, believe me, if I'm going to be one of his followers, God's got to change not just my belief in who he is as the Son of God, God has to change my social preferences. Are you there? There is a part of this that I must tell you that frightens me. I want to try to, you see, control him. I, I want to try to control this revelation and get him to fit into my already organized plan for my life so that somehow God gives me a little bit of help to, so that I'm feeling more forgiven and less afraid, more confident, less filled with shame, more with a sense of direction, less uncertain. <laughs> when in fact, if I'm going to be a follower of Jesus, a part of what he wants to do is literally bash my certainties so that I have to completely and utterly depend on what? God in a manger? At one level, it's, as Paul said, totally foolish. And yet, that is, in fact, the price. That kind of profound leveling of social preferences goes through the entire gospel. There's a new translation of the New Testament written by David Bentley Hart. It's actually a kind of um, transcription. It's, it's not as literal as maybe some. But what he's trying to do when he writes it is get a, tear away from some of our ability to lay over something on the New Testament and therefore block out some of the power of what it's saying. It, it's like our unwillingness to believe that somehow Mary, the mother of Jesus, was something other than a poor peasant, barefoot and 14. It's like the medieval art that wants to make her this beautiful Anglo noblewoman. And what Hart says is this. He said, a part of the shock of the New Testament was that in, quote, a highly stratified, aristocratic, boundary-policing ancient world, the ordinary person took center stage. Their tears, their smiles, their laughter, and their joy captures us again and again, and it's a shock because these people could not have been worthy, a worthy object of any well-bred person's sympathy nor could the grief of one who was only a poor fisherman possibly possess the short, sort of tragic duty necessary to make it worthy of anyone's notice. A part of the startling nature of what it means to be a Christian is that it says in a way that was quite unique in its time that all of us stand before the gospel, each completely and uniquely welcome. So if I am to come, I have to come not on my terms, but His. And so the more I stand there and realize how far away from that manger, I want to observe almost as if to keep me at arm's length from its implications. I, 
I begin to wonder whether God is even interested in me at all. Because quite honestly, and isn't it true for you, we really do want God to fit into our expectations rather than we fitting into His. And it creates a kind of weariness of soul. I was watching Twitter today and a friend of mine who's a priest over in England says, Christmas is the time where the collar feels tighter, the vestments feel heavier, and I wonder if I'm not just a fraud. Listen to the poem of G. Studdart Kennedy. G. Studdart Kennedy, Church of England, chaplain to the army during World War I, a man who wrote with a tremendous clarity about both the power of suffering and the strength of the Savior. And it's entitled, Come Unto Me. Come unto me, it sounds like a mockery, a voice that calls a wounded man across a weary space that he cannot travel. For we would come to thee, we long to see thy face, but we are wounded sore, and evermore our weakness binds us, darkness blinds us. We stretch our hands out vainly toward that shore where thou art waiting for thine own. We groan and try and fail again. We cannot come. We are but men. Come thou to us, O Lord. Come thou and find us, shepherd of the sheep. We cannot come to thee. It is so dark. But hark, I hear a voice that sounds across the sea. I come. I come. I come. That's what we are invited to right here. And in the midst of our own struggles, our willingness to somehow keep going, hearing the slightness of that voice and wanting to move toward it, with all of the ambivalence and fear that is in my heart, a surprise awaits me when I get there. You see, because I know so much of my own weaknesses, what I expect to receive from the Savior is actually a reprimand, or at least a look of disappointment, if nothing else. And yet God, God in Jesus shows me a very different face. The last, a little story from a book called God is No Fool. Who am I? I was born with a need to laugh. Laughter cleanses me, it settles me, it stimulates me, it fills me. I was born with a capacity for laughter. And one day, I had a laughing day. Everything was a straight line. Every situation had its funny side. All day, I poked and teased and giggled and laughed. And I had to work diligently to interrupt my laughing day with periods of serious work. But even then, they got jostled with humor, and I didn't care. I met laughing people all day, people who giggled and reacted and joked. I looked into laughing eyes and laughing faces. My heart was warmed. My soul swelled. Eventually, of course, things calmed down. They always do. But then in the quiet of night, in the quiet of prayer, I saw Christ. His eyes were red with tears, and I felt sick. I looked and looked at him. At his tear-reddened face, and I think I saw him squint. <laughs> and I, I saw that the tears were, were tears of laughter. His eyes danced and twinkled and softly, he even chuckled. And that night, I took a step toward Christ, and I loved him as I never had before. And I would follow him anywhere. For unto you is born this day a Savior, tidings of great joy for all people. Christ the Lord, that if you are willing to take the steps to listen to the voice that calls you, that when you finally get to the stable, it will feel not a place of shame, but a place of welcome home, a place where your heart finally says, here, it's not what I expected, 
but here is where I belong. Among a group of people I never ever would have expected to enjoy, and yet this is where the Savior is. This is where the Savior is. Why would I want my life to go as I want it if what I lose in the process is the laughter in the eyes of Christ? Oh, foolish man I would be. So tonight, come to this Savior. Get past solemnity to exuberance to laughter and the capacity to know that on this day it is joy that is appropriate and not sadness. Because we have come to know the light of the world. Amen.